Good morning. Open your Bibles, if you would, to Mark chapter 10. Jason, I couldn't get here quick enough. I was like, man, just sing that again. Oh, just our worship this morning just gave me the chills. What a blessing to be here this morning. I want to encourage you as well. It's just been a great morning. If you haven't uh, had the opportunity to, to be with us in Bible class, I was sitting in one of our Bible classes. We have several for adults, of course, several for children as well. But I was sitting in class this morning and was just enriched and encouraged by the study and by the discussion. I just want to remind you that it's so filling and the table's been prepared and so I invite you to come and eat. I also want to encourage you to be praying for us uh, this summer. We've got a lot of wonderful things going on, a lot of folks serving. We've got our, our, our youth group back. They're all over the place this summer. They come back from two different uh, in serving and making a difference. We've got two or three yesterday. Brethren and the, the kind of the we have there will be. Incredible things that people hear. those in Midland that are struggling to get their get back on their feet and, and get homes for their families. We get to host them in our church building. Does anybody here ever sleep in church? <laughs> we got a job for you. So they, they come and they stay in some of our classrooms through the week. Of course, they're going to either work or training during the day. And so we get a chance to feed them in the evenings and visit with them and interact with them. And then we always have volunteers that, that sleep over uh, so that they need anything during the night. So if you're good at sleeping in church, this is the ministry for you. And so uh, you'll see the sign-ups in the foyer. I want to remind you about that. As we begin in the, in the Word this morning, let's pray. Would you join me? Lord, we're thankful for today. We're grateful, Lord, for the privilege, the honor, the, the blessing, the expression of Your grace that You have saved us and that You have placed us in a family with all of its uh, blessings and all of its challenges. Lord, thank You for the place that you've put us in here at Fairmont Park here in Midland, Texas. Lord, we ask now that you would bless us, that you would guide us, that you would lead us as we open your word. Lord, help us to see and to hear and to do what you would have us to do. We pray in Jesus' name, amen. As we get into the text this morning, there's a couple of background questions that I think is important or it may be challenged in the text. And so I ask you this morning, do you believe that Jesus loves you? I understand what the correct answer is. We've sung that song a long time since we were pretty small. But that's the very thing that can be challenged from time to time. When you and I are going through different things in life, one of the questions is, does Jesus really love me? Because the follow-up question sometimes might be, then if he loves me, then why do certain things happen? Or why does he ask of me certain things if he loves me? Because isn't Jesus loving me, isn't that about always positive things and good things and enjoyable things and pleasurable things? Is it possible that Jesus could ever ask something of me that would be difficult or painful? And if so, I guess the question is, why would he do that? We'll jump in the middle of the text in Mark chapter 10, verse 13. I noticed something in reading this a while back. There's a word that Mark uses unique. Now, this account is repeated or paralleled by Matthew and by Luke, but Mark has one word unique that the others don't use, and I just I don't know, I hadn't noticed it before. So in verse 13, it says, They were bringing children to Jesus so that he might touch them, but the disciples rebuked them. Now, I can imagine why parents would want to bring their children to Jesus, because if he could touch them, they've already been seeing miracles from Jesus. They've already heard wisdom from Jesus. So if there's any influence that Jesus would have on our children, wouldn't we want to bring them to him? 
So think about why disciples would want to rebuke that process. And that's an important word. You may have a slightly different word in your translation, but the word rebuke is a strong word and it means to correct, but it comes with it someone speaking from a higher position to someone in a lower position. In this case, then, that means it probably has a little condescension to it, a little, little superiority to it, a little who do you think you are or what are you doing sort of flavor. So people are trying to bring G, uh, children to Jesus, and the disciples try to stop it. But when Jesus saw this, he was indignant. That's a strong word as well. He was indignant, and he said to them, Permit the children to come to me. Do not hinder them, for the kingdom of God belongs to such as these. Now, there is a difference in being childish and childlike. Childish denotes the idea of immaturity. But childlike, we begin to hear and to sense the idea of an openness, of an innocence. It is so much fun to play with little grandchildren. It's even more fun than playing with their parents when they were little. And we're reminded again, maybe it's because we're a little later in life. Maybe it's because we're not so dead dog tired and exhausted that we're actually enjoying them and then hand them off to the exhausted parents. But we're reminded about just the joy that's in a small child's laughter and the simplicity in the way they see things. Now, they, they, they hurt their finger, they smash their finger, or something doesn't go right. They cloud up in rain. They're so responsive to their situation but I've learned a new trick that when our oldest grandson, that when he's hurt in some way, if I scoop him up and if I blow on it, I learned that from his dad. Don't know why that works, but if I just blow on it, all of a sudden he giggles and he's healed. Hallelujah. <laughs> but I think probably the most impressive thing that I was reminded of and as our kids were that way when they were little too, is that children have such short memories at least in the situations of what is it that's made you sad? What is it that's made you upset? What is it that has ruined your day that you've gotten so upset? Is when they recover, there's like it never happened. Such an example of an open heart. So Jesus says, this is what the children of God looks like or who it belongs to. Verse 15, Truly I say to you, whoever does not receive the children of God like a child, I'm sorry, who does not receive the kingdom of God like a child will not enter it at all. Now that's interesting. Jesus says, in fact, this is what we've got to be like or we're not getting in at all. So this characteristic of being childlike, this characteristic of this, this openness, this genuine wonder, I think my favorite thing right now about our oldest grandson is his sense of awe and wonder. It's so easy to provoke. I can simply show him a toy and he goes, oh, wow. He's so easily impressed or awestruck. He's not, he's not jaded. He's not negative. He's like, oh yeah, I've got something better. Or is that all you have? It's just easy to move his heart. And Jesus says, this kind of characteristic, you've got to be like children or you can't enter the kingdom of heaven at all. Huh. Amazingly, in verse 16, Jesus took them in his arms and he began blessing them, laying his hands on them. He didn't just touch them. That's what the parents had hoped. And he blessed them. Surely the parents had hoped for that as well. But he gathered them in his arms. Jesus was the kind of person that small children were attracted to, that they wanted to be around. And then Mark shows us something different right next to this, the next thing in the passage. In verse 17, as he was setting out on a journey, a man ran up to him and he knelt before him and he asked him, good teacher, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? Now both Luke and Matthew record this story and when you combine those two as well, you find out that he's young, but you also find out he's a ruler in the synagogue. So he is an impressive young man. He is living his life in a morally upright way. He is recognized by his community as a leader. He's ahead of the curve. He's ahead of his time. He is someone that people respect and look up to as he is a spiritual leader in their synagogue or in their place of worship and of learning. This is the guy that we would be proud of. 
We would say, man, this guy, he's doing so well. He's growing so well. What a great example of a godly man. Well, he's not necessarily an evil man or an unrighteous man. I'm not suggesting that. But it's interesting how this is the guy that we would say, put his face on the poster because this is what we're looking for. Besides that, we see this earnestness. He comes to Jesus. He's interested in Jesus. He kneels before him. He submits before him. He calls him good teacher. And my understanding, the expression that he used was very unusual. So unusual that it could be understood as either flattery or absolutely sincere respect. I think it's the second one. Because everything about him is he is wanting to know something that he believes Jesus knows. His question is great. What shall I do to inherit eternal life? These are the people that Jesus is looking, looking for. Is people who want to know more about real life. Eternal life. But Jesus answers him in an odd way. He says in verse 18, Why do you call me good? No one is good except God alone. Huh. You know, some folks have looked at this verse and thought, Wait a minute, is Jesus saying that he's not God? That he's less than God or that he is imperfect or that he is in fact not pure? And if that's the case, of course, that makes his sacrifice on the cross meaningless. But look back at the verse. Did Jesus say that he wasn't good? Did he say that he wasn't God? What he said was is, why do you call me good? No one is good except God alone. Now, we can have good qualities. There can be goodness in us. But the only one who is truly good, without any shadow or any flaw, is God. Even our little precious grandchildren are not good in its wholest sense because they throw fits. They have little tantrums. They can be selfish. In other words, they're not just childlike. They also can be childish. And that's not all pretty. That's why there's the term, I think it's called the terrific twos that kids go through, right? Jesus didn't say that he wasn't good. What he said is the only one who's truly good is God. It seems like what Jesus is saying is, you're asking, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Why are you asking me? You can only be asking me if you understand who I am. Because if you ask anybody else, it will not be sufficient. We have neither the wisdom nor the power to grant access to eternal life. Only God. And so in a sense then, Jesus is not saying he's not God. Rather, he's intensifying, I can only be God to answer your question. So before I answer, is that who you understand me to be? Why would that be important? We ask people advice all the time. We ask for answers all the time. And we gather things. And we are naturally a curious people. And what do you think about this? What do you think about that? This time, though, if you really want the answer, then you've got to really ask the right one. The importance, if you were to ask me or anybody else, well, what do you think? And I told you, well, I think, okay, I give you my opinion, but when this life comes to an end and you stand on the brink of eternity, you need something more than my opinion. You need truth, not an opinion. But you also need power. Because how, how are you going to get from here to there? How are you going to overcome your sinfulness and your flaws and your brokenness to be able to stand in the holy presence of God? You're really going to need somebody else. You're really going to need God. So the first thing Jesus seems to do is say, have you thought about who you understand me. You've called me good teacher. You've knelt before me. What's coming next? You're going to have to accept that it's coming from God or this isn't going to work for you. In verse 19, he continues, You know the commandments. Do not murder. Do not commit adultery. Do not steal. Do not bear false witness. Do not defraud. Honor your father and mother. 
It's interesting that Jesus begins to list the Ten Commandments, but he doesn't list all Ten Commandments. In fact, he starts at the bottom half or the second half of the list. There's a shift in the Ten Commandments. You see early on where God says, You shall have no other gods before me. You shall have no other idols. You shall not take my name in vain. That the first half of the Ten Commandments are about God and our relationship with Him. And then it shifts to, and if this is true, or if you're accepting or obedient to this, then here's how you live with each other. And then what happens, the rest are relationally. So it's fascinating that Jesus starts with the bottom half, if you will. I wonder why he doesn't say, you can have no other God except God alone. You can have no idols, no images of God, and that you shall not take his name in vain, and you shall keep the Sabbath holy, for the Sabbath is about God. It's about your time and your relationship and your worship with God. I wonder why Jesus doesn't deal with that at all. Well, I don't know. But I wonder if he starts at the list where most people are, are, are likely to create the checklist. Because these are the kinds of things that sound like actions. Okay, I haven't done that, haven't done that, haven't done that, so I'm good. Because remember what he asked, what shall I do? Give me an item. That's not what it means to have eternal life. A thing to do. Rather, it's about the kind of relationship you have with God. It involves things, but it's so much more than that. It's so much more pervasive and even evasive. You can't do relationships by checklist. You can't do marriage with, all right, what's the 10 things I have to do to, to, to be married? It's an all or nothing. It's a one flesh. It's, it's totally absorbed in it if it's going to be real. Because if it's a checklist or if it's a part-time and if it's on Mondays and Tuesdays but not on Thursdays or Saturdays, it doesn't even make sense. He seems to give the part of the list that most of us would feel comfortable with I got that. Now, we may not want to pursue it too much further because what does it mean to truly honor your father and mother? Or as Jesus would teach on the Sermon on the Mount, that to not commit adultery is not just the action, but it's also the heart and the commitment and the focus on one another from the heart. But still, this is a place where we, yeah, that's what he says, verse 20. And he said to him, teacher, I have kept all these things from my youth up. Now, I don't know how he sounds to you. I will tell you that I've always thought that he was kind of an arrogant jerk. That's the way I've always taken the rich young ruler. I've always thought, well, he's a pompous, self-righteous guy, just thinking he can stroll in, add one thing to his list, and he's out. But Mark's challenged my thinking because this is a guy who's called Jesus a good teacher, and it's a word that's unusually um, intense. He falls at Jesus' feet. He's the one that came to Jesus. It's not like Jesus went to him and he's not listening. He came to Jesus to ask the question. Jesus doesn't seem to treat him as you're a liar or you're disgenuine. So the man says, I've done this from my youth up. That's why he's a leader in the synagogue. He's a respected, godly, moral person. Verse 21 Looking at him, Jesus felt a love for him. See, Mark's the only one that says that. Matthew and Luke both tell you the conversation and what Jesus said in response, which we'll see in in just a moment. But Mark says that when he's saying this stuff, I've kept these things from my youth up, he's saying it from a kneeling position, looking up to Jesus as a good teacher. And when Jesus looks down at him, he sees a young man who has done so well and has been focused on trying to follow what God has said and is deemed as a success. His life is in order. He's in a good place. And Jesus looks at him and feels love for him. So Jesus' response is not, it's not judgmental. It's not, it's not harsh. It's not, uh, it's not sarcastic. It's it's. It's from love that Jesus says next what he says. Jesus felt a love for him and he said, One 
thing you lack. He asked for one thing shall I do. What's this one thing? And so Jesus speaks back in his language. Well, here's the one thing that you haven't done yet or you don't have yet. It's what you lack. And then the whole world explodes. Because from his knees, the young man leans into it because he's about to get his answer. That's why he's there. That's, that's what and who he's pursuing. And his whole world is about to blow, be blown into a million pieces. This man who's ahead of his time, this man who's successful, who's looked up to as a spiritual leader, who is genuine. He's kept these commandments from his youth. And because he's a synagogue ruler, that means he is taught the same. One thing you lack, go and sell all you possess and give it to the poor. And you will have treasure in heaven and come follow me. As far as I know, this is the only person that Jesus lays such a requirement on. All are called to come and follow him. That's what it means to be a disciple. To be a Christian is to follow Jesus. If it's not that, then it's nothing. It's not to be a church attender. It's not to be a Bible quoter. It's to be those that follow Jesus. That should involve Bible quoting and church attendance. But you understand, what's happened is he's come short. He's lacking. And if we come short of following Jesus, we're in the same place. We can have our life seemingly all together and we can be even in spiritual leadership and we can be recognized and appreciated for, for our, our knowledge of God and our, and our seriousness about following God. But if we're lacking the same thing, then we're in the same place. For this man, he struggles with idolatry, which is the first of the Ten Commandments. Maybe that's why Jesus started with the second half where he could say, well, yeah, 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 I got that. And Jesus has to then challenge him with, but you've glossed over or you've jumped over the idea that you will have no other gods before me. And idolatry is such a ridiculous, ancient problem. That's back when people were so uneducated and unsophisticated that they would get a tree or a rock and they'd carve a face in it and they'd say, oh, this is our God. That's what idolatry is, right? Well, you know, idolatry is replacing God with anything or anyone else. Most often, idolatry is simply identified by the average bathroom mirror. It's just who we are. Can I get an amen? That's where we are. That's what we struggle with. And so the Ten Commandments or this relationship with God is about, number one, that He has to be first and everything else flows from that. Why does Jesus tell him to sell all that he possesses? Well, verse 22, but at these words he was saddened. He's not just saddened, it says, and he went away grieving. Grief is the word we use when we experience pain from significant loss. He goes away grieving, so he's experiencing pain from significant loss. He's lost something, but since he's not willing to give up his possessions, what is he grieving? What has he lost? The answer to his question what shall I do to, that I might obtain eternal life? Jesus tells him what it is, and he can't or won't do it. And so this respected, religious, godly leader walks away grieving the loss of eternal life. I've always wondered, what's it like for him the next time that he leads the lesson in synagogue the following Sabbath? What's it like over the next course of the year or so as he continues to hear about Jesus' miracles and healing and, and, and hear his words? What's it like for the rich young ruler when he hears whether he was there or whether he hears about this good teacher that ends up being crucified and hears the rumors about the missing body in the empty tomb? I always wondered what the rest of the story was. 
but he walks away grieving. And my question then is, why did Jesus ask him this? Because he doesn't ask anybody else. In fact, there are other folks in the New Testament, Old Testament as well, in the New Testament who have considerable means, and he doesn't ask them that question. Right across the page in my Bible, or chapter 9 in Mark, Jesus had just been teaching in verse 43. He says, Mark 9, verse 43, he says, If your hand causes you to stumble, cut it off. It's better for you to enter life crippled than having your two hands and go into hell into the unquenchable fire. Verse 45, if your foot causes you to stumble, cut it off. It's better for you to enter life lame than having your two feet to be cast into, into hell. And he says the same thing about the eye. How many things would you give up before you'd give up your right hand? There's a pretty small list of what I would hold on to before I'd give up my right hand. And Jesus says, don't hold on to things that will cost you your soul. You may think you can't live without it. You may think that you're crippled. You may think that you're, that you're in, in a terrible position, he says, but don't hold on to something that will cost you eternal life, cost you your relationship with God. That which influences, distracts, and pulls you away. He says, let it go. It'll be painful, but let it go. And to the rich young ruler, he says, there's one thing. It wasn't his right hand or his right foot or his right eye. It was his possessions. That's not true of everyone, but it was true of him because he was grieved. Brothers and sisters, we live in the wealthiest nation in the world. That's not a bad thing. It's a blessing. But what is our relationship with our stuff, with our wealth? Jesus asks the young man to give up the one thing that was more important to him than to Jesus. In verse 23, And Jesus, looking around, said to his disciples, How hard it will be for those who are wealthy to enter the kingdom of God. Folks, that's us. We're Americans. We're the wealthy. And is it hard for us? Is he saying it's hard for us to enter the kingdom of heaven? Verse 24, the disciples were amazed at his words because in their mindset and in ours, those who have their life together and successful, that means, that means they're doing good. I mean, they're the ones that got it figured out. And Jesus says, not necessarily. The more that we have, the more that we can, the more we feel like we don't need. I don't really need God. We've got it covered. We can solve the situation. We can figure things out. Jesus says it's hard for those who are wealthy to enter the kingdom of God. The disciples were amazed at his words. But Jesus said, children, how hard it is to enter the kingdom of God. It is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter the kingdom of God. I don't care how much soap you put on a camel, that's going to be a long day. Jesus intentionally describes something impossible. You're not, I don't care how much effort, you're, you're not going to get that done. That's the point, is the wealthy can't be saved. Well, why not? Is it hopeless then? Because we're not getting the camel through the needle, so is it hopeless? Verse 26, and they were even more astonished, and they said to him, then who can be saved? I mean, that's not even, looking at them, Jesus said, with people it is impossible. You're not getting the camel through the needle. You're not. But that's never been the point. The Ten Commandments was never about what you could get done. The fatal flaw in the pursuit of Jesus for this young man is, what good thing shall I do? It's never been what we can do. Don't misunderstand me. Obedience is necessary. You've, you've got to be twisting the concept. You're like, oh, good, I don't have to do anything. No, no, that's not the point. But the relationship doesn't depend on what we do. We didn't die on the cross. Jesus did. We can't forgive sins. God does. 
The change, the healing, and the miracle of salvation is God's work. Yes, we have to respond. We have to accept, of course. But if it's about what we do, then there are two pitfalls, two extremes, both deadly. One is, all right, I've kept these things from my youth. I've got this covered. I have been to Bible class since I was born. I know the names of the 12 apostles. I can tell you the books of the Bible. I got this. And that self-righteousness will cost you your soul. Because it's not about being good at church. It's about following Jesus. Now the other extreme is just as deadly with, uh, maybe it's more authentic, more often it's more real. <laughs> that it's more genuine, that this, it's more honest where you say, I can't do this. You're talking about being holy as God is holy. Do you understand who I am? You know what the kinds of things that I think about and the things that make me upset and where my focus is and the mistakes I make, I am a mess. So I guess there's just no hope for me. And in both cases... One is, I guess, we walk away with God with our eyes closed, and the other is we walk away with our heart broken. But in both cases, you separate from God. Jesus said, it is impossible for us. The change that has to happen in our lives is impossible. We're supposed to be patient and loving and kind and forgiving, and gentle, and joyful. It is impossible. It's not that Jesus said, here's the list, now get it done. Because we can't. How many times do we fall far short of the holiness of God? For that is the standard. It's not about being better than my neighbor, it's about loving my neighbor. It's impossible. And so Jesus says, with people, this is impossible. So if we're asking people, if we're depending on people, if we're counting on people, it's not going to work. It's impossible. With people, it is impossible, but not with God. For all things are possible with God. God runs camels through needles by the herd. It's no big deal for God. That's why the question is, why do you call me good? Only God is good. Are you asking me because you believe I'm God? Or are you asking me because you think I've got good ideas? There's a world of difference in the two. Because you don't just need Jesus' answer. You need Jesus' presence. You need not only His wisdom, but you need His power. Because he can tell you what you got to do is get through the needle. And you can try that all day long and you're going to have a vicious headache. Because you can't. But if you follow him, he'll lead you right through the impossible needle after needle after needle. I wonder why Mark gave us that little paragraph about the children by the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, why does he set us up for that? Because for the rich young ruler, it's about the what's the one thing that stands between you and God? One thing more important to your heart than God. What is it? And it may be possessions and it may be other things. It's interesting that the chapter begins with marriage and divorce. There can be the occasion where our spouses become our idols or our own selfishness in our marriages can become our idols. If we had more time, I would encourage you to read the rest of the chapter because I'm going to say it's humorous because I don't know how else to call it. Because after this amazing flow through this experience with a rich young ruler and Jesus says that it's impossible and that the wealthy can't be saved without God and all of that, the next thing that happens is Peter says, hey, you know, um, we left everything for you. What do we get? You can almost see Jesus going, oh, there's another needle. Because the needles just listed in the chapter are a self-centeredness in our relationships, a rejection of children, the distraction of wealth, 
and the selfishness that blocks us from ever developing a servant's heart. At least those four needles are mentioned in the chapter. It all spins around. It is impossible for us to experience the true change that we so desperately need without Jesus. So why does Jesus tell him something that is so painful that it causes him grief? That's not a light word. That means to suffer pain from significant loss. Why would Jesus do that to him? A guy who's a good church goer, he's even a leader in his church, he's a respected member, he's got his life squared away. Why does Jesus do this to him? Because for all of his good attributes, he's never gone through the needle. He's only gone through what he's capable of going through. Never has he surrendered to be led to the impossible. So what are the things in our lives that we will not surrender because we've already decided it's impossible? What is the forgiveness that we withhold because that's just not even conceivable? What are the risks in faith that we've been unwilling to take because we think that's not possible? In what ways have we held back from trusting God and what he's called us to because we couldn't see how it could work. To follow Jesus is to follow Jesus wherever he leads. So this morning, I encourage us so many blessings and positive and wonderful things I see in us and among us and, and God working. But I don't want to come short. I don't want to have one thing lacking. So we must always strive to submit to Jesus that whenever we face a needle that we understand only Jesus could lead us through it and if he leads, we will follow. So is there anything in your life that needs to be surrendered today? Is there any idolatry that's crept in? It's probably not a tree or a rock you've carved in your yard, but is there anything in your heart that's crept in and is competing for your devotion to God? This morning we have the opportunity to confess to one another. James says, for when we confess our sins to one another and pray for one another, that we are healed. And that's what this is about. It's about healing. So we invite you to one of these front pews where you can go out into the foyer and there's a banner on the wall on the left there that says next step. And you can visit with a, a shepherd there and talk to them and pray with them in person if you need to. But remember, whatever you're looking at and you're saying, that's impossible Jesus is saying, that's the doorway to the heart of God. If we can encourage you in any way, we invite you to come as together we stand and sing.